a playlist original. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Back to the Box Buster with your hosts, Gaius and Jackson, recording after a very long holiday weekend. Oh my god, yeah, for <laughs> both of us. I mean, yours was longer, but we both, it's funny, we were just chatting this about how both of our Independence Day is fall on like the same weekend. My ours was on a Saturday, but yeah. you're just coming off a big bender. So how you yeah, feeling? Yeah, a big old bender. <laughs> uh, so ours, uh, you know, the Fourth of July uh, was as of recording today was yesterday on Tuesday. So we were recording on a much way different day than we normally do. It's usually on a Monday. Um, I've re- I recorded. Yeah, I've recorded with like Owen on like Wednesdays or Thursdays occasionally uh, for the deep dive, but like rarely is like the main show recorded this late but yeah like yes yesterday was independence day and of course that all kind of starts at the start of the weekend when it falls like during the week because i think the idea to fall on yeah i think the plan is for most people like well yeah like we'll celebrate like really celebrate like the weekend and like maybe Mm -hmm. we'll just chill on like the actual day and like have a barbecue it's not really i mean it might be like that for some people it's not like that for our group where they were like no No. let's just go out like like there's a lot of give uh, it a few years like I kept, everyone kept waffling about trying to leave yesterday. And then like everyone, I think was kind of like feeding off each other, trying to make mm-hmm. everyone stay out. So there's yeah, a lot yeah. of like, a lot of like, we're not fucking leaving, like going on yesterday. We're going to stay out. We're going to do it. Right, uh, right. Until like, you know, our bodies are just like, dude, you've been doing this since Friday. It's time to go home. God. Um, so yeah, and it was long. The late, the late Hates. recording and day so for late us. Recorded. Yes, not only not- just because you, this is not a gayest thing. This is I... We aim for Mondays, and I was coming back from a, a crazy overnight canoe trip that ended in disaster, <laughs> caught in the rain. By the time I got back, I was in no shape to, to be recording. So we definitely both uh, bore the brunt of a long, drink-filled weekend, but it's good to be yeah. back and good to be chatting. Yeah, and we and yeah, I think it benefits from us doing it later. I mean, I between like my brother's birthday Friday and then like the holiday weekend and just 4th of July, it was just a long weekend. And it got yes. to the point where, where like I was trying to describe stuff that happened on Saturday and then someone would be uh, like, no, nah, that was Sunday, man. I'm like, oh, the days well, just it just all started to blur together. Um, yes. It was fun. There was like no, 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 uh, no drama, no, 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 nothing. It was great. It was a great weekend. It was just so very very long and i also ca- came out of it with a gnarly gnarly sunburn that is so oh painful. yes <laughs> i uh, can imagine i got some uh, sun but it was mostly overcast here we've had terrible weather lately so i'm looking kind of not like my caspery self but still, <laughs> uh, still got some work yeah. to do this summer yeah my um, shoulders my shoulders are wrecked right now they are yeah. uh gotta they, get like, that sunscreen will, on my man i know i i i, you know, I reapplied to it just didn't work and I woke up. I woke up in pain. Like I've never been in this summer. <laughs> like, I, I, yeah, like, I've been there, man. It sucks. Yeah. So, um, um, like, I guess it's like a battle scar from a really good weekend, though. <laughs> exactly. We got some stories. Another yeah. good thing, though, about uh, recording on a Wednesday. So, just kind of where I'm at and how things work over here. I don't know if either of, like the theaters near your place have like a a, a deal night. Like over here on Tuesday, it's always cheap it's night Tuesday tickets. For us. Have... Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah there yeah, you go. Yeah. So we're always recording on a Monday, like right before I'm going to go see the next release, usually on a Tuesday. So luckily I get to chat a little bit of what I saw in theaters yesterday, which was, uh, and I have not seen Indy yet. I know I'm, I would like to see it this week, hopefully, because I'd love to be able to actually have an opinion and chatting about it. But I did see Wes Anderson's new movie yesterday, Asteroid City, which was phenomenal. I mean, I'll just say, I'll just preface by saying not my favorite Wes Anderson movie, but anybody that loves Wes Anderson will love this movie. And it was like awesome. So don't get me wrong, but a great theater watch. His movies are just beautiful to look at. They're so colorful and palatable and his shot composition. And obviously it's like a big trait of his um, are just so appealing to the eyeballs, but it was nice to be back in the theaters because I hadn't seen anything. Uh, I hadn't seen a new release in like probably going on a month. It feels like, so it was good to be back in the, in the theater, even though it was uh it was it was wasn't a too much of a long one, but I wasn't missing any good weather, which was nice. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't suppose you got a chance to see that one yet. Though. I Have haven't seen it yet, it? but my brother wants to see it. I, okay, I, to, I like add it to like the list because like I feel like after this weekend we fell behind a little bit. Uh, I know he wants to see Asteroid <clears throat> City. No he he, he um, he's so I haven't seen it. Um, he saw uh, he saw No Hard Feelings over the weekend. Uh, okay, he he enjoyed what that. He, that was funny. he thought it was yeah. really funny. That was good. Uh, cool. And then. Um, and, you know, he wants to see Joyride. Of course, he wants to see Insidious. That comes out uh, this weekend, too. Well, we'll see it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been busy. <laughs> um, We're full on the swing now. 
Well, with Asteroid City, because that cast is pretty stacked. Is there? Man. I'm, I'm guess I'm guessing there's only people that are in it for like a hot second, and then that's unfortunately, it. some Perfect. huge names that have like a minute to five minutes of screen time. It's crazy. Like, but every single character in there is a familiar face, pretty much, with the exception of some up and comers who play like because there's quite a focus on some of the younger uh characters right. in this movie some of them of which that like, you've seen before um but yeah no not a not a cast member is wasted it's everyone's nice. it feels like this movie is just populated by a-listers it's crazy but margot robbie was somebody that i was and jeff goldblum two huge names i was expecting to see more of that didn't get a whole lot of screen time but they're impactful nice all right yeah, yeah. i do want to see it. i do want to see it because i like his stuff i love you know we always talk about directors like when you see their movies you can tell it's one of their movies and he, he is, is he's one of those people example yeah, so much so that family guy dedicated like one of their episodes yeah to, you know that That's episode hilarious. yeah, yeah it's hilarious Quentin Tantino, and i think it's michael bay is the other one yeah 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 family it's, guy fans know what i'm talking about that was yeah, hilarious that, it was so, so spot on too because i mean <clears throat> yeah and uh, of course you know uh when you when you get made fun of like in by something like Family Guy, it's like yes. because you're relevant enough and yourself's good enough that they can kind of like poke fun at it. Um, yes, that I remember Wes, Yeah, I remember Wes, Wes Craven. I guess felt some kind of way in the beginning when they, they made Scary Movie, and he was like, "Oh, like I feel like they're making fun of Scream," and like Marlon <laughs> Wayne, Marlon Wayans and Sean Wayans who did the first two Scary Movies were like, "No, this is like a this is like a form of flattery. Like your movie was great, That's and it was what I was going to say, was, yeah, and it was great enough for us to kind of poke." And it's interesting too because Scream in itself is like kind of a it's a little satirical in its approach to like that's a how great it, point how it posts fun at horror movies so um but i think wes Craven was like didn't get it i think he got it later on when like even kevin williamson like explained to him later like hey no this is this is good if they're making fun of us that means that we are part of the pop culture zeitgeist guys and uh exactly we should, that's important so yeah so yeah that family <laughs> guy that family guy uh example is so great because we yes. just want to like watch that again because they 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 <laughs> says, when that show when that show lands it lands hard and it lands really well uh when they have like really good jokes but um but yeah i do want to i do want to check that out I, most of the stuff i've been watching has been at home lately uh i finished the arnold schwarzenegger documentary on netflix that was really good yeah i uh, saw that it was out <clears throat> i haven't seen yeah. it but um he's somebody i really admire so i would definitely check yeah that out. it was you know it's a really I mean, it made me like him more. I mean, this is really someone that came over here, believed in the American dream, and yes. really want and really wanted it, and really accomplished it. it, and accomplished it. And like they split it up into three, so it's like you know his bodybuilding career, and then his acting okay. career, and then of course you know him becoming governor of California, right? For uh, the cool side of things, but yeah, he's done it like, all, he, man. He's done it all, and you know it talked about his kind of career highs and his lows. I thought it was so interesting because so many people are re-examining this movie now and they really like it as a cult favorite now uh but he said you know the last action hero was his first flop as an actor and oh wow, like, i didn't know that and, he flopped and that really got to him for a little because he thought he had something really good and like you know it that movie was hard to market too because it's like a joke within a joke and it's like a lot i mean okay. there's a lot it going on in it um but I thought it was cool like people have been pointing out that part of the documentary and going on like twitter and instagram being like but the movie has such a bigger life now it's like one of those right. like it feels like it was one of those like forgotten gems that like we don't know how that did so bad when it came out but like they really enjoy it now and okay and Good. i think he sees and, I, and it's cool that he gets to see that now considering like you know what the flock kind of meant to him yeah at the time and then also i mean if i if you if you have hit after hit after hit after your hit and then suddenly you land one stinker that probably will get would get to you a bit understandable yeah uh, i can see why that would bother him but uh yeah, that guy's got nothing to worry about no he's, he's no a he's pretty he's sweet good. career he's he's good and you know i think uh i would say that he should feel happy with what he's accomplished because like I, he's i don't think he's ever gonna I mean, his show on netflix i haven't watched it yet i know it got renewed for a second season and Is it a food uh, one yeah yeah um and that's a good like i think kind of second act to his career i don't think he'll ever have like the status of an action star like he used to because he's like you know he's he's up there in age and well, he's got uh, the legacy of it i don't but think he has he a legacy of it, doing right? it yeah right and like i remember like you know wondering what he would do post being the governor and he did some movies and stuff that but they weren't really like on the level like of what he was Terminator making genesis or whatever yeah, right? yeah. Oh. and then he and then in dark oh. and then he did dark fate which was supposed to uh he's in that too yeah um but then you think about all the great stuff that he's done, like you know, Predator, Total Recall, yeah. the, ter the Terminator, Terminator Two, yes. uh, 
Running Man, Command. Like, is there so many like There's, good action? You could go on like, forever. I mean, I mean, I mean, even when he dabbled in comedy, he, like Twins and Kindergarten Cop, like he's like been able to like kind of mm-hmm. do it all. You know, some misfires. You know, he Batman and Robin. It, some people, <laughs> oh, some, that's right. <laughs> Some people it, that like movie to, on paper makes sense though it just yeah. who could have imagined yeah you right as right crazy as it is you're right because you're coming off of batman forever which kind of like even though they did lighten things up and made it more like kid friendly um right. it made a lot is of that, money is that Val Val, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 it made Remember, it made, not as well for some of my earlier batmans which is a right. shame it made like it made a ton mm-hmm. of money and it also was like okay like there was that whole kind of like I hate to say stink because I love Batman Returns, but uh, a lot of parents when that movie came out that summer because there was like all these like Happy Meal toy tie-ins when they oh. took their kids to go see Batman Returns. My my I've always said this: Batman Returns is a Tim Burton movie first and a Batman movie <laughs> second. <laughs> and, right. uh, I love that though, man. I love Tim Burton. <laughs> and it's so dark and like so inappropriate at times. So Warner Brothers was like, "Yo, we let you Tim Burton way too hard." So we have to like change course. So Joel Schumacher changed course a bit. Um, by the way, yeah, a bit. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, a lot. By the way, apparently there are a lot of people that got to see uh, Kevin Smith screened it uh, somewhere, but the Schumacher cut of Batman Forever, which I've been wanting to see forever, because apparently it's a little darker, uh, kind of like what he originally signed up for when he signed up to do Batman Forever. I, okay. There's like a lot of deleted scenes in it. They actually showed it okay. to like a PAX crowd i forgot in what city but very lucky the people i follow one of the guys that uh like ran it and he said it was a really good time people really enjoyed it i hope that it gets a release because i would love to see like what other take that movie had that might have been a little better yeah he's got i think he's got this stained on his career but he's a good filmmaker obviously we both love the lost boys like that guy can make a good movie so i'd be interested to see that too yeah he's and he's always been like a little bit well when he was alive, you know, like a lot of style over substance. Like, you know, The Lost Boys is a good looking movie too. Like yes, everyone, everyone looks it's cool. also cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And he cares about that. And, but he also, you know, people forget that he directed, like, I mean, I'm forgetting uh, like, something right now. Like back when, like, back when, back when everyone was adapting like John Grisham novels in the 90s, I mean, he, yeah. Joel Schumacher did two of them. He did The Client with Brad Renfro and Susan Sarandon, which is re- really solid. And I think he did an even better job with, a time to kill like a year or two after that with like uh matthew yes. mcconaughey and yes. sandra bullock and samuel jackson so he's and, 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 and i like and i like phone booth too like he did he does some good stuff i mean Is the, the call one yeah 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 oh like, he did that man yeah like, so batman right, he is yeah batman forever has a soft spot in my heart because uh i just remember that experience of being a kid and seeing that in the theater and it was just fun uh batman and robin you know it's I mean, they took the kid level and then like multiplied it by like 20 <laughs> and yes. And like you said, on paper, that sounds like a good idea, right? If you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're, you know, you're George Clooney, like stepping in to play Batman, like, hey, that, that last one was a hit. Let's just like do this. And I don't think they realized that the studio was like, yeah, we need you to have like more scenes that we can like use so we can make like toys and like all this other mm-hmm. stuff. So that's why it's just in the studio metals, nothing yeah. ends up going good. So I don't blame it. I can't hold that against but them. You know what? Falling Down is the one I'm forgetting. About. Oh, yeah. Bad yeah. Bad. That movie's awesome. That's a great movie. Yes. Um, and then, you know, also to um, you know, like a lot of movies that were perceived to be bad when they came out even batman and robin has a bit of a cult following now mm-hmm. i think i think people watch it at in a mystery science 3000 kind of way to make fun of it but okay sure it, it, it has some it has some fans now um yeah. you know it almost it almost killed the batman franchise but whatever yeah well uh <laughs> what we had a little bit of a hiatus after that i wonder was there another yeah Schumacher so one? we had no we had like so after batman and robin it was like no one went to touch it and then christopher nolan was the first one to do it with batman begins what a brave but, and that's why yeah very brave and that's why it, it's weird to think about what that was like before uh batman begins came out because batman begins even though it looked good from the trailers and everything we were seeing and it had like a really for that kind of movie a really great kind of prestige cast too it wasn't just yes. like a bunch of no names there was people still probably a lot didn't of people. trust it though they did they didn't they really they were like um i and that's why i think that movie did well it didn't make a ton of money as much as it probably, the, but right, it could have a little bit better and i but it did what it needed to do it set the tone for like what they would do next which is like something you know 
even better. Yes. We're, gonna, we're gonna talk about like you know, <laughs> yeah, in a yeah. couple in a couple weeks. So coming like up. Uh, coming <laughs> up. Uh, so yeah, but it is weird to think of a time where people were like, I don't know about this Batman Begins, and you know, I think that's why too. Now, like people, a lot of people will say they go back and watch Begins, and that one gets better for them every time they watch it. Hands up, and I didn't even have that perspective. Like that's the first Batman movie that comes out when I'm born, and I didn't right. have. But growing up, I I had seen imagery and and clips, and right. maybe on the TV, like just scenes and stuff from the goofier Joel Schumacher ones, um, and yeah. even in Tim Burton's, um, <clears throat> and that wasn't how I understood Batman. So like when like Nolan's is what I grew up with. So it's funny to see that there's definitely a, a divide amongst generations and even half generations from people that weren't around for the other ones. But that's definitely something because I wasn't really privy to like what Batman was like before Nolan's. That was just the yeah. one I grew up with. Um, but yeah, no, I'm really excited for coming yeah. down the pipe. And what, um, and, what a, and what a one to grow up with. Man. That's a, that's a solid. Yeah, dude, uh, it's, I'm very, very pleased. I, yeah. Yeah. It was objectively awesome. Circle yeah. back to Tim Burton for a moment though. I remember I, and apologies if I have already mentioned this, but I feel like a few episodes ago, I, uh, we just got busy. I never got, we, we hadn't chatted what we've been seeing, but I did see uh, Ed Wood finally, which is like one of Tim oh, Burton's, I'd say one of his I finest like movies, yeah. uh, one of his many with Johnny Depp, uh, all black and white too. And just, yeah. I love a movie about the industry, about Hollywood. Yeah. And that was a cool, have you seen I have seen it. It's been a yeah, while. That, it's been a while, man. Yeah, but it's it's good. Man, worth it's a revisit. Like, that movie was awesome. Yeah, it is one of his better movies too. Um, Def, I think yeah, people generally agree on that. And I love I, most of what I see by him, and that was one that I really thought was. I used to special. I used to consider him my favorite director when I was younger. Okay, and then I, and then, and then like that, that. changed. And then that kind of changed as like you know, it's funny because I always talk about David Fincher. David Fincher is like probably one of my ah, favorite uh, directors. Man. Um, and, but you know i always appreciate it like out. you know we talked about like wes anderson style like you, when you see a tim burton movie too you like know it's him hard to as miss well. yeah. and like i just love his like you know he gets a lot of flack sometimes for being more of a visual guy too than like you know good with storytelling but you know uh he plays to his strengths and like his strengths is you know he throws so so much like sometimes it's really like out there imagery but it, you know it works you know for all the stories he's telling yeah. And you know, he so. also he also can tell that he likes stories about like misfits or people who are misunderstood or like outcasts. You know, outcasts. Yeah. I feel like, you know, like like if you ever watch Edward Scissorhands, that's that's, that's Tim exactly Burton. what came to that's, mind. Yeah. That's that is that, textbook that's, Tim Burton. That's Tim Burton. And that character is basically Tim Burton. Just trying to like feel understood, you know, in a world that he doesn't understand. And like, but uh I but you relate to a lot of the stuff that he does though. I mean, it's really uh really well done. I'm yeah. I mean, he still might be he still might be in my top somewhere in there but like, uh, oh be, i think that's a great pick he, yeah he that's used to be good. number one back in the day is, is there a number one right now this is on the note of it like i know you just it, mentioned fincher it's still, is it still the case i think it's i think it's still fincher and nolan's like a close second mm, like a that. really really, really fincher uh seven like desert island seven oh yeah man. Uh, yeah i remember showing my roommates a few years ago that movie like i used to live with uh, i live with one of my roommates from the back in the day now just me and brad shout out brad um but Brad and I lived with a couple of our other good buddies right early pandemic. We didn't know how yeah. long we were going to be stuck at home. We were all kind of wrapping up school at that time and didn't know what the future was going to look like. So we said, fuck it. Let's just, you know, grab a place yeah. and wait it let's out. And that was a great opportunity to show, put the boys on some awesome flicks. And seven was one that I showed them that like universally was very much a praise. And that was yeah. the last time I saw it. And uh, man, I, like that movie just gets better with every watch it's a great pick yeah i low-key uh yeah i'm with you fincher's great i, I might i, I kind of want to use that as a deep dive too one day i think that might be a good one but it is a really popular yeah. movie but i mean it's like, popular but, but it's there's been some time in between like you'd probably be yeah. putting people on it and probably a lot of viewers or listeners that know david fincher that maybe haven't gotten around to seeing that one yet could put no. people that could be the push so you must be really excited then for the killer, which is what like October, yeah. this year, November. Yeah, so I think it's October. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm always excited for his stuff. I mean, he's also cause a very. I mean, I know he has like kind of a rep for being like he's like not a bad person to work for, but he wants a lot of takes. Like he does like a lot, a lot of takes. He uh, reminds me of like a modern Kubrick, not cr quite to that extreme, but like right. the closest thing maybe we, that we have. Yeah, like Jake Gyllenhaal talked about when they did Zodiac, and he just he remembers doing so many takes of like almost oh, every scene that they did, and that, and you know, I love that movie too. Though I mean, that's like one of my favorites by his. I don't think he's made a stinker other than Alien Three, but that wasn't his fault. So not his fault. Uh, 
uh, conversation so, for another time. You know, he turned, he made videos. like something like the social network very interesting, where it was like, oh, how do you make something like that? <laughs> you know, the creation of Facebook, <laughs> like kind of move the way it moves, but he, he did. Uh, but yeah, it's, yeah, and, you know, it's him, Nolan, and I guess Tarantino would be next. Like, if I had to talk Hard not to mention that guy, too, right? Like, Nolan and Tarantino come to mind. Well, honestly, all three of those. Like, I'm equally as pumped when all of those guys have a yeah. a movie coming out. But I feel like Nolan, for a living director, has, like, that slight edge for me. Yeah. And also, I mean, I guess he's a good example, too. Has not made a bad film there at you all. Go. Not even one, you know, that was mishandled by a studio or anything. Like, he hasn't made, like... That's right. You know, fin- he got lucky. You know, so he got lucky. Um, but yeah, oh, and other than, uh, I can't really, I won't say what the movie is on here, but I did tell you what we are yes. diving this week, and I watched that as well. Um, and it, ah, did you that, tell me that, what you were, you told me that you had your deep dive coming out, but I don't know if you I mentioned did. what it was. You did? It's a, sc- it's a scary movie. Um, and I, Damn, will I give you, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a little hint when we okay. did the bling, you, when we did the bling ring, you spotted one yes, of the actresses. I remember already. I remember there already. There you go. <laughs> There yes, you go. That's what you did. I thought you maybe you meant you told me today, like right before we recorded. I was like, I don't remember you mentioning anything, but you're right. This was last week. That will be awesome. So yeah, I'm excited, excited to get into that one. And haven't talked to Owen about how we we were trying to like not talk to each other about the movie until we record now. So it's like yeah, you know, ah, first nice. time, like first like first time hearing it. Um, so I, I like don't even that. know if I don't even know if you liked it yet. So we'll see. Um, okay, <laughs> I remember being a little bit like iffy because that movie was. Actually, no, I won't even get in. I don't want to spoil it, but I love that movie. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, I'm no, I know, it's good. Watch. I was about to go and on so, a tangent and I was like, I can't yeah, spoil good movie. this. And like, yeah. you know, a lot of good, a lot of good horror films, some good like social commentary in there. It's not like within that story. There's like, you know, yeah. like hor- horror is always really good at that. So I, that's why I kind of wanted to pick it too, because it's not just a straightforward, you know, some yes. slasher film or something like that. So yeah. It's got a little Those, bit of substance in there. Yeah. So I think that would be a fun discussion. Uh, Later today, actually, I we'll be think having. You're it. totally right. Yep. Um, so, so yeah, we can like hop into some news here. Yeah, um, what do you want to start with? You know, I'll start with the. <laughs> the I'll start with uh, Superman because. Yeah. When we, when, when we recorded yes. our episode uh, last week, uh, the casting for Superman Legacy wasn't like at least for Clark Kent and Lois Lane, wasn't uh, kneeled. Uh, down or it wasn't nailed down yet. It was they were having people screen tests with each other, and we mentioned like a few names like Tom Brady, Nicholas Holt, uh, Rachel Brosnahan, a uh, few different people that were going for the parts. And I swear, I think like was it the day after we uh, recorded? It was. I remember. Yeah. They they landed on uh, who their uh, Clark Kent Lois Lane is going to be. They obviously and, didn't. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, David Cornsett and Rachel Brosnahan. Um, and you guys, if you've seen an image of this dude, he looks well, he looks a lot like Henry Cavill. He has like very Henry That's been Cavill. a big topic of conversation. <laughs> yeah, in and Hollywood. Then, yeah. And then a lot of people who are, you know, still diehard Snyderverse fans, you know, Henry Cavill fans, Man of Steel fans, are like, why did you pick someone that looks the part? And then the other side of that was like, well, they wanted someone younger because they're doing a younger Superman. And then someone was like, Henry Cavill's 39 and still looks great. <laughs> There's like, you know, there was a like a whole you know back and forth about this okay okay um i you know what i've i've only seen him i've seen him in pearl and i watched hollywood uh it was a netflix limited series that ryan murphy did yes um i think from what i've seen he's a good actor so there's that he's not just like a pretty face so at least there's i that. like him a lot in pearl he's a cool yeah. little uh uh like a minor yeah. well he's got a decent sized role for that movie but uh what's the word i'm looking for here he's just a good you know addition to that movie yeah, and a good yeah, actor yeah. and a role yeah, and so, then like oh, I've seen him in. And then Rachel Brosnahan. I've only I've I don't watch the show. I've only seen like snippets when I'm at a friend's house. But from what I've seen from the marvelous Ms. Maisel, she's good on that. And um, she I, and like what I was struck by. I think they both kind of looked the part. I can see her as like Lois Lane, and I can see him as Clark Kent, Superman. And I don't. I mean, other than of course, you want them to be talented, and I think they got that in Spades too. So. You know, this was casting news that didn't bother me at all. I did feel bad for mm-hmm. Nicholas Holt because Nicholas Holt has, for someone who is as talented as he is, like I get like character actor vibes from him. Like I don't really see him like necessarily leading hundred percent, like Couldn't leading stuff like more. this. But he seems to really want to lead stuff like this because 
in case you guys don't know, it came down to him and Robert Pattinson for the Batman when that was when they were casting that. Oh, okay. and he, he lost out on that. Um, and it wasn't like a choice of like one actor being better than the other. Like Matt Reeves had a certain vision for who he wanted his Batman to be, and it was closer to Robert Pattinson. Yep. And so, uh, hey, you know what? Great decision because we got yep. I love our Pats Batman. So yeah. And then um, after that, he went for a role in Top Gun Maverick, but we don't know which one. So it could have been Miles Teller's. It could have been Glenn Powell's. I bet you I, he was my, going for Miles I Teller's. I think it's Miles Teller's part. But Tom Cruise liked what he auditioned with so much that he wanted him to play the villain in Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. And he did take that part. But then because of delays and all that stuff, he had to back out because it, it conflicted with a show that he does for Hulu called The Great. And he had to film that. So he couldn't do Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. This is or, news to me. Okay, that's some good insight. That so, uh, that blows for Nicholas Holt. So, so, and then now he lost out on Superman Legacy. There are some people that says that he still has his hat in the ring for Lex Luthor. But like we mentioned, they're, the Skarsgård brothers are also in contention for that part too. And they haven't revealed who they've picked yet. Um, uh, for one of the websites I write for, I wrote, I wrote a whole article about Nicholas Holt because I just felt I don't know. He's a good actor, man. He's got like the chops. Um, but yeah, I get the vibe. Like, you know, clearly he wants these kind of leading man, like big blockbuster movies, but like, easy work, I, right? but he's, yeah, but he seems like he's at home and the stuff that he's really good at. And like something like the menu, I didn't love Renfield, but he was, but he was good in that. And, yes. uh, I'm with you on, you know, on it, but he, he can handle action as we've seen. Cause you know, if you can endure Mad Max Fury road, you can <laughs> endure anything. <laughs> um, yes. And he has superhero chops already because he was in those X Men movies. I mean, I know yeah, he wasn't the lead. He wasn't the lead, but like big enough part that he he could clearly handle it. I I don't know why he's just coming up this short <laughs> every time. I know. But... I, I'm I feel like it's kind of kismet because like I totally agree. He's a character actor. I'd love to see him just kind of go off on some indie projects and really put all his effort into some you know roles that don't that we're not necessarily going to be stuck with for lack of a better term for you know 10 and 12 15 years however long we'll have right. david corn sweat and i would love to see you know everything that nicholas holt has to do now that he has the time and he's not going to be committed to doing superman so i don't know yeah. i hope he doesn't uh i hope he just keeps rolling forward and doesn't you know take it too personally or get discouraged because he is still a fantastic actor and a guy that <clears throat> has been very busy the last few years that is probably not even in his prime yet like yeah, exactly. we're yeah. eight, eight years off Fury Road and he was memorable in that. And we were talking about Nicholas Holt back then. This yeah. is almost a decade ago. And he, this guy is still not even in his prime yet. So I'd love to see what his career looks like. Going I mean, forward. it's crazy to me too. Point. Cause I kind of, for, I kind of forget that like Nicholas Holt, when he was a kid was in about a boy with Hugh Grant. Like he's the, he's the kid in that, like the main kid. And I've never paid attention to that because I've, Seen that movie a handful of times. In, and, in sorry, and what? And what? A, a, about a about a boy. About it's about called a boy. about a boy, and he plays the he's the uh, ch child actor in that has a really big part. You could tell even then that once oh, you realize okay. it's him, that he had like a lot of potential and stuff. And nice. I think I don't I don't think it, I think it was like Warm Bodies when I started paying more attention to him. Yeah, uh, that's as right. A, as an adult, and then of course he was uh, cast in like the X Men movies and then like Mad Max and uh, I got a. I gotta yeah. back up for a sec. Was Mad Max Fury Road 2015 or 2017 or I 16? Think I think I want to say 20. Uh, I'm blanking. 50, 2015. I thought it was 15. Uh, I was confident when I said that, and now I'm not at all. Uh, we and 2015. Yep, 2015. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Yep. Disregard. Good stuff. Yeah. God, I can't believe that movie's like kind of that old. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and like, crazy. where's Furiosa? I know they're filming it, but like, why did we not get that seat or uh, spin off? Like closer to well, sir. Fury Road swept at the yeah. Oscars. Like that movie was awesome. Got lots of love. But anyway, yep. at least we're getting it. So that's good. I also love that year it won the most Oscars. I know it was like most it was all technical awards, but I love that yeah, it won. Yeah. It could it could end the night by saying that it won the most Academy yeah. Awards <laughs> the night after that night. That was, was like over. one of the first ones I watched. Uh like Oscars. Like I'd maybe seen bits from the other ones, but that was a memorable night for me. I was yeah. very happy for it. Um but Rachel Brosnahan, who I was really only familiar with for uh, Mrs. Maisel, which I haven't seen, but like that's what I associate her with. I'm just like browsing through her IMDb, and she's she's had a lot of small parts, and she's she's done a pretty diverse catalog here. I'm seeing that she was in like 19 episodes of House of Cards, which is pretty cool. Nice. I've always I've seen a bits of that show. Would really like to yeah. see it. She's in like uh, Craig Gillespie's The Finest Hours, which has been on my watches for a long time. Patriots Day. So she's been in some stuff yep. um, beyond yeah. that. 
So this will be she, huge for her, no doubt. Yeah, I, I, I'm guessing that uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel was like her big break as far as like, you know, she's won, I think she won like Emmy Award for it. and uh, Two Globes, two, I'm seeing. Two here. Globes, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but this, you know, this will be her probably biggest uh, project, you know, as in terms of scope. Uh, this is a project that launches you into super stardom. Right. If it goes and, well, if it goes okay. well. And apparently they said out of everyone that sent in the tape uh, throughout this audition process, male or female, uh, she had consistently the best audition tape. Uh, right for, on. And go, girl. they kind of knew that she would, she would be the one, but they had to do like the whole chemistry read test yes. and all that stuff. Um, and so I thought that was really cool. Cause like, you know, they've been asking her cause she's promote, she was promoting the final season of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel when all these murmurs started like, Oh, like they're interested in you for Lois Lane. And she got asked that so much during her press tour, she had to give like a diplomatic answer. Like not, she couldn't mm. say like, she couldn't say, I, Oh, I've been going out for it. All she can do is be like, you know what? It would be like a blessing if I got it. And you know, it's cool that people think I would be good in that part. I think she, cause she already knew that she probably was going for it, but she right. had to like really be like, you know, kind of keep it kind of a secret. Um, but yeah, I thought that was the most interesting thing I read about that was like out of all those people that, uh, that, that came down to those final few, huh. they said that she was like, you know, hands down their favorite. Um, so that's good for her. And this movie starts Superman Legacy starts filming, I'm guessing, next year, 2025. I would get well, it has well I don't think so. I think that James Gunn got a pass at the script's initial script before the writer's strike, but he can't work oh, on it right. now, but he can't work right. on it now. So oh, it, it just depends on when the writer's strike ends, and then we might we might still get a screen actor skill strike, which is like a good uh segue. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um segue into that uh, and to all that um you know we when we recorded uh oh also before we move on to i i um there's not a whole much to add about the superman news it was just you know just updating you on who was in it i have no dog in that fight they, they both seem great um just in case people were hoping that like we were like you know kind of like oh are you sure them i, I really think they'll be fine so yeah uh, i got no gripes uh, with either yeah yeah, so that comes down to that. But um, yeah, we, we recorded last time. We recorded on the Thursday, and like that next day could have potentially been a Screen Actors uh, Guild strike. Uh, <clears throat> and I was like looking at my email, I'm like, did it happen? Did it happen? Did it happen? And then I started seeing stories on Deadline that they were maybe going to have talks to extend uh, their negotiations. And that is what they did. They extended their. Uh, contract through july 12th so they can continue uh hashing some things out that's promising okay. news uh but fran drescher who is actually the president of uh, the screen actors guild right now um she was on good morning america and i just happened to be watching it while i was doing work and michael strahan asked her if they were making any leeway as far as you know the negotiations and what was working right. and that was two days before uh the actual potential strike and she said they are in certain ways and then other ways they aren't even mm -hmm. close so oh, great you know so i kind of hope <clears throat> that by extending the contract to july 12 really isn't that much longer it's like that's next mm. week uh um, seven days from today yeah yeah, oh, well. yeah yeah um you know so they're hoping to hash some more of these things out um but yeah, we'll see. Well, so so far, you know, if you're in the Screen Actors Guild, you can still you can still uh, get some get some acting done. You you probably won't be able to go to Comic Con still because you know that's uh that's still not in the cards for a I lot of you really, guys. Really, really hope we don't get that double whammy of a. Right yeah, because we're in. Uh, I, I believe we're in day sixty five of the writers' strike. Oh boy! Um, and in this in this statement, uh should make you understand kind of where the writers are um i i think so i think was it you that that said like who do you think is going to back down first will it be yes the, and well this is what they released today the show they were they released this to say that they were in solidarity with uh sag and their choice to strike if they need to okay and, um they said we will not comment on negotiations while they're still in progress um, but we will back. Uh, we'll be back to you at the appropriate time to discuss where we are and where we go from here. Our eyes, though, are not on a date, but on a deal, on a goal, and uh, and and that goal has not changed since May first, and will not change no matter how long the companies take. 
it is to fix a broken system to rescue creativity from the tech companies and the conglomerates and to make the profession of writing viable for us and those who come after us. We all understand that the company's continued refusal to recognize and remedy the legitimate concerns of labor keeps us on the picket lines, keeps the industry at a standstill and keeps thousands out of work. And so we will continue to walk in front of every studio and remind them that whatever path they take at the end, that path is the writer's guild and there is no way around this. See you all on the picket lines. So they're not getting out. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm very happy to hear that. And that, that is a very powerful statement. And you know what? It's hard to really argue against what they're fighting for, isn't it? Like yep. totally get behind them. And yeah, and, and I was a good, you know, in that statement, like we've been saying this before, these projects don't get made without writers like you can't really let them get around it the hard way right you can't you can't get around that god i forgot uh i also run on deadline today too like no tv shows are filming in la right now because of uh the continued writers like everything is shut down uh in la uh and and it's costing you know I, I'm just speaking of California and Los Angeles there's, there's billions of dollars uh being lost right now because uh I strike that yeah mm -hmm. so it's uh it's crazy that like i commend the writers for you know digging their feet in the sand and be like, like no we're not we're not giving easy. up but i yeah. think it's so crazy that these bigger companies are like maybe just waiting to see like oh maybe they'll just like we can force them to back down because they need to work um, right and and you know it just makes them look even worse like they have all this money coming in and i know i mean this is an interesting thing to, see, to say today because disney has been disney has gone through it a lot lately especially with how indiana jones has performed this weekend and then right. elemental not really that. yeah yeah uh so yeah i mean but disney of course they have like a lot of money so it's like they may lose yeah. but like you know right and but yeah it's not just them it's netflix it's everyone like they have all this like revenue coming in that they're being so sketchy about and like some of the, the wealth hoarding. Yep. Yeah. You know, and then like, I see on Twitter, a lot of the writers who are striking um, are, you know, they want more, especially when it comes to streaming services, they want more transparency about how these shows are doing. If you're going to tell us that, you know, it's really difficult to negotiate a residual deal based on like, you know, streaming performance, then you need to show us like what these numbers are. Cause like, right They're, they they pick and choose when they want to say like oh this was our most watched movie on the service ever or our most watched show in a week but a lot of times there's no, no like proof, numbers to no back backup. Up. <laughs> yeah. yeah so it's hard and, to take take it seriously so yeah Which, so like if you're going to tell them that you, they can't you know you know there's it's a really diff, you know a new business model we can't figure this out quite how you want us to mm. um and i'm not saying if that transparency was there that the writers would back down a bit but i think they if they saw more like you know, for, I mean, I'm not saying this is the case, but like, for all we know, the way they hide the numbers, like some of this stuff might not be doing as well as they are saying it is like, but that's I'm what it's sure like. the case for many things, especially yeah. when they, they don't divulge numbers on intentionally. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like, it's like, you know, it's come to the point where like, I think almost everyone, even like casual people that hear this news are like, I think we are past the, the days of like, let's just take your word for it. Like we need to show yeah. us some, show us something. Yeah, you know, that's why that's why movie box office like people like seeing that because like you see the money you see like hey this did this much money this weekend you know mm -hmm. this is how much this movie costs this is what the potential like win is or what the potential loss is like you know even even though the nelson rating system is so outdated now at least you had like the numbers you know millions of people watching whatever to back that up um and but with streaming there's just not that it's just a bunch of like heads of the companies like boasting how just well taking something their did word for it yeah <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If that means anything yeah um two quick points i wanted to add just about this before because i'd like to get on to indie here just yeah i i said side note because when you mentioned about losing billions of dollars this is where yeah, i yeah. wanted to bring up but i wanted to say too that it's kind of cool i think these moments like the 65 days that we're into right now looking back at this time if things go like how we think they're gonna go this will probably be like the beginning of like a revolution in streaming. Like if they, if the writers do, you know, hold their ground and end up getting what they want, like we'll probably yeah. see more transparency. Um, and also, and like, you know, they'll be, you know, paid adequately for their work. But I think this will be a, the last we see of this era of streaming if they get what they want, which is going to be cool to 
look back yeah. in a few years and be like, I can't believe it wasn't this way before and for so long because streaming has been relevant now for would you say 10 years, 12 years? Yeah, I mean, something it, like yeah, that. I, is there something no, like that. Number? I, some, somewhere around there. And like, you know, and I, you know, I'm speaking to someone that I love having streaming services. It's great. Uh, right. For us, for us as viewers and stuff. But I also fully support calling them to the table to be like, well, what, you know, we well, provide us with some proof. <laughs> that's <laughs> great. Know? My second point that I want to touch on is like, and I would never expect people to do this on mass, but it's kind of a cool, uh, I guess, thought experiment maybe, or something to just put out there. It's probably the way to support the writers. If you're wondering how you can support them the most, I bet you it would be to cancel their, your, you know, your uh, streaming oh, services, you're, even if it's you're. temporarily, I, if millions of people did that, you know, I bet you they'd be at the table way faster. And you know what? I, like, fuck them. I, I agree. <laughs> I I think that I think that would be the case if they, if they lost like a Even lot if, of memberships in mass. If millions <laughs> mass of people rows. did it for a week or a month, oh yeah, it'd be over. So yeah. just something to chew on. If you're looking to support the writers, I bet you yeah, that would be the way to do it. But right, that's and, just you me know, and, thinking. And the and the SAG stuff is a little different, but like you know, the one main similar point between the WGA and the Screen Actors Guild it is that residuals regarding streaming. That's the one thing that these, one of the things that they really have in common uh, as far as why they are strike or in the case of SAG, mm -hmm. there could be a potential strike. Um, you know, I, I, they, I think they want to see that transparency there too. Um, 100%. And like I said, I think, you know, compared to like the strike uh, from 2007, 2008, again, the guilds are supporting each other and that helps a lot that you know I can imagine. Not just, and you know it, but oh god the industry if like two of these things go on strike that are on strike at the same time that, that's that'll be crazy <laughs> i and, really don't know what that happened and there are certain projects that are to stand still right now because you know you can announce them and be like hey and like a lot of the stories that i've seen lately is like you know i've saw casting news for like uh, a third tron film and i think that's great but like they would love to start shooting in August, but that's if uh, mm. there's no strike. So, like, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is <sighs> kind of like in limbo because they don't know when their productions can start. Uh, yeah. Based on all this. So, there's yeah. also, because obviously we've talked about this before about some like legendary shows or shows that never had the chance that were canceled because of the fallout of the last strike. There's yeah. a lot of great properties out right now that maybe just needed a strong season one or two that might not get it because. Unless yeah. I might end up getting scrapped, which I really don't want to think about, but I bet you in a few months or maybe a year, we'll be talking about movies yeah, or man. shows that, uh, shows <laughs> probably in particular that didn't get off the ground. For those of us that were there, uh, the 2007, 2008 writer strike fucked up some really great shows. Um, right. I was a huge fan of Heroes that had a great first season and the writer strike kneecapped that Killed in it. season yeah. two. <laughs> and, and, uh, could have been. It. and then Lost, even though Lost went on, uh, creatively that having to strike happen during that particular season was a bummer uh prison break fans also i wasn't a huge one but oh, i know people who were prison break fans i, they all, I watched they, all prison break they all mentioned the 2007 2008 writer's strike it affected that show there's a really good show that only ran for a season called pushing daisies on abc that was really good that didn't get a fair shot because of the writer's strike uh so yeah like I mean, there's a lot there's a running joke for people that actually do remember that they're like oh yeah i remember yeah. like screwing up so many of my shows are so many shows yeah. that I promise. Uh, yes. So like, it's you know, a shame. it's a shame. Uh, so get it together, guys. Please. Give them what they give them what they want. Yes. Studios. Uh, just come we, on. We also, we also want people to get back to work because that's really important. Yes. Cause like, cause like the little guy is not working right now because of this too. It's not, I mean, the writing and writing actor stuff is important, but there's like even the smallest positions that work on film and TV uh, sets are not working. And yes. that are even people that provide costumes like that. This they interviewed some guy here in LA, you know, his shop has been like shut down since, uh, since the writer's strike started. Cause like he can't provide costumes for productions cause nothing's in production. So even, right. so, so even like, you know, it's very every, far reaching. Yeah. Every job in this industry is like, kind of like, Oh, want to figure this out so we can get back to work. And you know what too, that, why even when they, if they come to negotiations, it's going to take a bit to, Get into the groove of getting back to work so it's not That's it's right. not going to be an it's not going to be an instant like uh rebound all right all right everybody we're gonna shoot tomorrow like <laughs> they have to still like get they <laughs> yeah. have to get 
everyone back together and like you know People's schedules are gonna have been yeah, changed schedule, like crazy, schedules are gonna probably. change yeah since there's no there's no writers rooms right now so like tv shows are gonna have to like get back into their writing rooms and like get ready to like write for whatever at this point the fall i don't think the fall tv season is gonna happen when it's supposed to because we're in july and usually uh network tv it usually goes back to work around august to start shooting and they haven't had writers rooms to even like get that ball roll, rolling so right even even when this ends it's gonna take a bit to get back to work Boy. so you know looking dismal that's, then is what you're saying yeah, yeah. so sorry to report <sighs> such more sad news but like hopefully uh, they'll, they'll get their stuff together well, at um, least we've I, staved off a, a sag strike so far anyway for now at least for seven days so we'll see we'll yeah. see how that <laughs> small that w's goes. um yeah yeah um i don't know do you want to uh do the indie stuff first or do you want to talk to trailers first uh, it's up to i mean we the we i mean i guess it makes sense as we were talking about something financially losing money yeah and, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and trailers would be a good way to segue into the next week's box office so yeah why don't yeah. you why don't we yeah pitch it over to indie did you get a chance to see this yet because i don't feel like I, you chatted it no i have not seen it yet oh um, perfect okay i'm actually happy because uh, if we if you do are you planning on it yeah, yeah, I am playing on it. I'm I, okay only because I need to. Well, then maybe I, I I have some friends that like really enjoyed it, and other friends who didn't. Like, like people I trust on like, you know, their opinion on this kind of thing. It's been yep. so it's been so mixed, and we kind of knew that going in to the weekend right. that uh, it had a bit of a polarizing response. It ended up ended up being fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, but like on the low end, like it's like sixty five or sixty six percent. Right, um, six point nine on IMDb, fifty seven meta score right now um you know when we did our bargain's predictions we mentioned that the movie was tracking to open in the 60 to 65 million dollar range yes and i said i think it's gonna land right spec dab uh on 60. yeah um, and, and pretty much and right i was pretty much right she ended up making 60.3 million over the three day weekend our most accurate guess so far to, if I yeah so guess. far i think so yeah yeah oh, congratulations so, i came in way low because i was you know just you're expecting, yeah, you're you're i think you're it was expecting, like 40 yeah. didn't i 45 yeah but you know what that your prediction because you were expecting a disaster but you're not wrong still because there is a no, disaster, still a disaster. At, at play here um you know if you count the, the estimated total from uh the 4th of july they think it might have made 82 million dollars over the extra days but we're just okay. talking the three we we're talking about the three-day weekend which is 60.3 million dollars um the problem is and this is a problem that has plagued a lot of the june movies which is why i read on deadline that uh so far uh the box office has made 1.8 billion dollars coming to the midsummer point and okay. that's two per, and that's two percent behind last year and I think that's because we had some movies in June that were supposed to be like huge that yep. weren't as big as they were supposed to be. So that's the flash and yep. that's transformers rise of the beasts. Uh, now we can kind of count, uh, Indiana Jones and the dial of destiny though. I think the one 100%. June release that like a big, that, that came in and like outdid his predecessor was Spider-Man across the spider verse that has Absolutely. actually made it. That has made a lot of money, even went back to number one the week before last. Like that's the one dream release that like, you know, came to play. <laughs> and these guys, uh, you know, <laughs> definitely that failed didn't. big time. <laughs> um, so why uh Jackson isn't so wrong about this being a total disaster is this movie costs three hundred million dollars to make. And they're oh. guessing around a hundred million plus more to market. Um it's not going to make nearly, it's not going to make close to that here. And the thing is too, I think the last movie, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, because it made 790 million worldwide, I think that benefited from the big gap between uh, The Last Crusade yeah. and that film. There was also this kind of good hype of getting Spielberg back and Harrison Ford back and, you know, revisiting that character. Because like, I think uh, before people saw it, they were like, okay, well, you know, let's be fun to dive back into that um the studio lucasfilm also was in a in much it wasn't in the dire straits that it seems to be in now at that time right definitely um, definitely that's true. there um i and i you mentioned this before too like when this movie got announced first of all this movie has gone through a lot i mean spielberg was supposed to do it and then he backed out of doing it because he wanted to focus on some of his other stuff that he was doing got james mangold to do which wasn't a bad choice i mean that's a solid 
director choice to come in and, and replace 100%. him. hundred percent. Love me some James um, Van Gold. But I think once the move, once he, once Spielberg stepped out and even having James Van Gold stepped in, I feel like that is when some of the interest in first, it started to fade a little the bit. The first domino yeah. was pushed, I think, there. And then there were, you know, there were some COVID delays, which is that happened to a lot of movies filming around the time that this was filmed. Uh, I heard that the aging stuff is really expensive as well. Mm. I'm imagining that Harrison Ford commands a pretty big paycheck, but it also seems like he'd be the kind of person that would maybe take a backing deal for box office. I mean, he seems like that kind of guy mm. too. Well, hopefully um, not this time around. Hopefully not. Um, but, <laughs> um, so what we're saying here is it opened to like, I think one, 70 globally or maybe a little bit lower than that uh over the weekend that's not a great start uh not for a 300 million dollar movie and this is the same problem that the flash had now that opening is that 55 million dollar opening for the flash was bad for a 200 million dollar movie plus 100 mm-hmm. million dollars to market um whereas that was in the you position think only 100 million you think that, that they, is that they, what they're going with that, that's what that's what deadline said i can imagine it being more money mm, to market. i expect more and actually too. i kind of think it might be more to market indiana jones too than what they're uh saying um but it's gonna lose some money it's what we're getting at it's not gonna turn a profit um and this has been a problem for disney lately uh i mean elemental is another one that despite having pretty good holds and like since it opened it opened too low Mm -hmm. to really benefit from those really great holds uh in subsequent weeks um but it also this is i think it's also talks of a bigger uh studio problem too because i agree this goes back to even may like if you look at fast 10 that's a 340 million dollar budget um it cleared 600 million plus you know worldwide but okay. it's still uh, it, when you have to, when your budget's that high and then it costs so much more to market the, your your level of success has to be so grand in order to like break even let alone 600 turn, doesn't like, do anything <laughs> at that point like that's not yeah. why they're making this to make pennies on the dollar you know what yeah. i mean like so you're right that is a big problem um and and like i you know i look at something like we mentioned before i mentioned i look at something like across the spider verse that was a hundred million dollar movie and it doesn't look like it. It looks like it was much more expensive than that. Uh, Elemental, I didn't see it, but I've seen clips. That's a two hundred million dollar Pixar movie. I mean, you can maybe make that for cheaper if you. I'm <laughs> guessing. Um, so that begs the question, man. I mean, cool that Harrison Ford got to have a last hurrah as his character. That's not, you know, and I'm and for people that I because I know I've seen people online that did love it because they love that franchise. Um, I also saw people who thought. And, and I, I don't believe in ageism at all, guys, but like there are a lot of people that kind of felt like it was kind of sad watching an older Indiana Jones trying to okay. do, you know, a lot of the action stuff and all that. Like they just didn't, you know, didn't like seeing it. It just, you know, that's not that's not their indie. You know, it's okay. It's, it's, it's those guys. It's the guy from the movies that came out in the 80s. <laughs> and, you know, that that's fair if that's, you know. It, it might be hard to take seriously, you know. You're watching I and watching it. I can understand that. Something. The guy is yeah. 80 years old filming well, this movie. Like it's hard to get around that. Uh, I think, like, just from what I've heard, we'll have probably more in depth discussion on this next week. Assuming if we both see it, which I'm very much intending to. I feel like, like, I feel sad for like from what I've heard about like just how his character is handled in this movie. For like I, it's one thing like I get like people that are lifelong fans of the franchise. I would expect them to be outraged. Like this, from what yeah. I, from what I understand, like he's just not the indie that uh, we were treated to when Spielberg was helming these movies. Even you know, yeah. say what you want about the fourth one, it's still very much classic indie. This is not that, from what I understand. Um, it's very much somebody else's story. He's the butt of the joke, like we've seen in very and too many Disney movies for too long now. Yeah. I think like the, this is a trend going back. It's be an interesting discussion sometime to see when the tide has kind of shifted when when it all started. I'd like go back to at least Eternals. Um, yeah, I but agree. Definitely a trend we've seen in a lot of um, classic, like antiquated. I don't want to necessarily like well, this is part of the larger problem, but I do think that kind of modern Hollywood is has a certain stance and has something to say about their classic male action heroes. Yeah. And this is one that I think kind of it's Indy's turn to kind of 
he was dealt this hand with you know today's modern writers and i think this yeah. is starting to people are kind of getting sick of it now and, and we're seeing this in the box not that's not the only factor obviously in this box office there's many we could go into but i do feel like that speaks volumes to what people are deciding that they're going to pay money to see and now with disney especially over the last few months i feel like people are kind of catching on as to what they're going to get when they go to see a disney movie even if it's lucasfilm or marvel at the end of the day they're the umbrella even, even if it's picks even if it's even pixar. If it's pixar yeah i mean like i and think the standards has just changed the standards changed now i mean we talked about it a little bit with uh elemental i think they shot themselves in the foot like they had no they had no choice with onward to put that to send that to streaming because like the movie was out a week before theater shut down so like right. it, had, it had to but their last yeah. couple of releases have gone that aren't tied to, that aren't tied to like a big ip like like a toy story or something like that they sent to disney plus so now you're giving you're giving the impression to people watching your stuff that like all right then i can just watch your this movie at home why, why would i watch why would i go pay to see yeah. it now um yeah i i agree with you i mean there's a lot to kind of say and with this being <laughs> such a disaster and like it's not just indiana jones i think it's a bigger problem too with like these big studio releases or agreed spending so much money on their budgets and like a big part not, of it not, and, not, and not getting the return that they need uh the international box office is important but it's less important than it has been like in years prior like it's it's gotten a lot harder to really break out i mean like Yes, and everyone will bring up when and like I've heard this in the same breath as Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Well, what about Top Gun Maverick? There have been years between like movies. Yeah, the difference. The difference here is there. We've had four Indiana Jones movies. Mm-hmm. This will be this being the fifth. Top Gun Maverick was the second one, so that's where they are different there too. Also, yes. Tom Cruise is the exception. He's not the rule. <laughs> rule. So like, right. I like so I well I think it's cool that Tom Cruise carried that movie to a billion dollars worldwide and yes. i think he's going to carry mission impossible dead reckoning part one to the same level as well especially i'm looking at the reviews it's like 98 percent fresh i think already uh mm. which is debuted insane. at 100 right when it came it it's debuted, out. At, it debuted at 100 with 54 reviews and that was crazy so like i get the comparisons but tom cruise is not harrison ford isn't tom cruise and tom cruise isn't harrison ford so there's like a difference in like the approach and the type of movie, Indiana Jones caters to an older demographic a little bit more so mm-hmm. than some of these other franchises. Well, for sure. I feel like at, at a glimpse, I feel like they do the bait and switch. Like this is a property that caters to the uh, to the older gen, but then it's yeah. written by a younger gen person who's kind of influencing what this movie becomes with their perspective on things. Like this is a great thing. You you said something that I, that prompted me to think of this, like in relation to Top Gun Maverick. Fantastic example. Look at how they treat Maverick or Top Tom Cruise's character. Like, yeah, he's kind of knocked down a couple pegs within the movie, but he's also still given the chance to be the star yeah. of his own movie. He yeah. has, you know, he saves a day. He's, you know, still has all the classic traits of his character. They don't completely bastardize him. Like, there's still a respect given to his character that I feel is missing with this movie, and I think that that a lot of it comes down to right to, to the writing and like just who's behind this project and that's a good uh, Todd Glenn Maverick being a good example too because there's the whole like you have Tom Cruise you have the face of like that first movie he's back and you mm-hmm. you know in a character that you grew to love in that first film you surround him with a younger cast but they don't overshadow him that's right uh, in, in any way whatsoever right so they all they all have uh you know Miles Teller in particular or even Glenn Powell have like a fair amount of screen time they're not just really playing second fiddle they're in there they're in it they're part of the action whatever but their character arcs aren't as important as his ultimately is and yes and like you said like there i think there's a more a little bit more respect for that character in big Top time Gun maverick um so there's a way to do that to bring in like you know have the older generation be happy and then bring in these new faces to introduce it to a new generation of viewers um that I think maybe Dial of Destiny might have missed. And, Very much so. And then also, you know, like I said, I think people still have, it's, I know it's 15 years, but people still have a sour taste in their mouth from the last one. And That's I, no doubt know, a factor. And, like, and, and that made money. I mean, but, but who knows? Maybe people, I don't know. I haven't really seen a lot of like, you know, Justice for Kingdom, Crystal Skull 
post. <laughs> this movie seems to have like, kind of uh, created not necessarily. I don't know if I'll go so far as to say a renaissance for Crystal Skull, but people are now looking at looking at it a little bit more favor favorably. Yeah. It doesn't seem to at least be the. I mean, depend. I've heard both of these, but uh, at least there's people saying now that it is not definitively the worst indie movie. Like I've heard that about Dial the Destiny now from many right. people. Not everyone thinks that way, but um, like Stuckman, for example, he he says that uh, he likes this one slightly more, but yeah, and here's definitely the, not everyone feels that way. And here's the deal. So I guess it made 83.6 million counting 4th of July. That's the estimate right now. Um, Deadline said if it performs like other older, older guy skewing movies, like No Time to Die, it could drop, uh. it, it could drop 57 to 60% in its second weekend which would mean it would have a second weekend of 24 to 25 million that is really wow. bad domestically they said that it could also they weren't expecting this but there could be a tight race between first place for dollar destiny or even insidious could sneak in and gross a little bit more and hmm. debut at number one and knock indiana jones down the second that uh if i wouldn't have guessed that, that you know that happens um but possible given and the, then and then dead reckonings right around the corner so like, i feel like that like De- dial yeah. destiny's box office run is pretty much over i think when that comes out yeah um, it really is um and you know i hate to, you know i don't want to kick the movie ones down but the, the headline for from deadline i don't know if they have anything against the movie uh they just said indiana jones and the dial of destiny tanks with five day 82 million dollar opening not, not too wrong. far and it says not too far from the july 4th disaster of superman returns which you know which at the time was like a hyped movie before it came out and then didn't debut as high as uh people okay. thought it was going to be considering uh its budget um and, interesting you know, comparison uh but yeah i mean if if they could have kept this lower um they could have maybe turn to profit here and they just they're not going to like we're talking a couple of hundred million dollars or more being lost if it uh doesn't Ooh. somehow Ooh, rebound it's stings. not re- it's not rebounding here and like and uh they said the indiana jones movies have haven't always been huge international players so it's you know okay it, interesting i would have yeah, thought they said, have international they said there well, they said there's some franchises that were born here that have that are strictly feel like American, even though it that even though that has like kind of it feels like a globe trotting kind of like that, well, that's feel exactly to what it. I was gonna say. Yeah, it but, does feel but that way. I was told like I didn't know this until I was looking at the box office for Ghostbusters Afterlife that those movies aren't huge overseas either. They do a little well, but they're not like they seem big. like American movies though. Movies. Yeah, more so than indie. But um, that's what we're kind of look at looking at right now. Um. And it and Indiana Jones is actually in the same a similar position to Superman Returns. They both got a B plus cinema score. Superman Returns cost two hundred and twenty million dollars uh, to make, uh, so a little less uh, than Dial of Destiny, but they were both in a position where they're gonna lose uh, a hefty amount of money. Um, so, so here's a question for you then: What do you think, if anything, maybe this hasn't been thought of yet, or maybe we're getting too far ahead? What do you think this has any implications on who's going to be hiring Phoebe Waller Bridge to write their movies? I know she's got some stuff lined up. She got a Tomb Raider series or a couple movies lined up, but since now there's been no time to die, which I don't recall how it did money wise, but I know a lot of people were upset about how James Bond's character was Was handled handled in that movie. She's got a role to play in that. I know she wasn't the sole writer of the movie, but I think she's had a big part to do with it in that. And now we got, style of destiny which is destined to be a, a bomb and then same kind of thing happens to this character do you any thoughts on to you know where you see her going i, I think she'll be fine i mean i think uh it, it's funny speaking of i have like <clears throat> i haven't seen the film so i don't really know how you know right the writing is and then like and then also her performance in the movie i've seen from people who thought they would be annoyed by her in the film they're actually thought that she because you know the whole dynamic of like oh this is my goddaughter like oh this is my godfather this whole like wacky mm-hmm. like you're the you're the older guy and i'm the younger like you know sidekick yeah. you know i could see hardcore fans being annoyed by that <laughs> aspect of it but i i heard that she's actually pretty decent and not bad in okay. it i i know that she rubs some people the wrong way i don't know what it is about her uh i i don't think i've paid enough attention to her stuff as an actor or writer to like really uh have a fair assessment of her, but I know a lot of people 
kind of feel that way. And I know it got I'm mentioned in the same a bit. Boat. I know it got mentioned a bit with No Time to Die. I do remember that. Um, yeah, this is where uh, I first heard of her was because and, of that and the rewrites and stuff. And like I, you know, I think I like Daniel Craig's James Bond movies, but I don't like have I'm not like a hardcore diehard fan where I'm like, oh, like I'm you, screwed that up, you screwed that up. Um, I love Casino Royale. I'll go that far. Yeah, so, I mean, I. But so, I'm with you. But yeah, you know, I think she'll be fine. I mean, okay. Uh, and then like, she she has a lot of stuff lined up. I guess Tomb Raider being. Uh, is it movies one. or a show? I think it's a show. I think it's okay. a show. I wasn't positive. Um, I know. I know she was attached to like a Mister and Mrs. Smith thing with Donald Glover, but she dropped out of that. The um, hell? That was supposed to be a TV show. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's still moving forward. It might still be with someone else. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think. Okay. Like you, I mean, I every, I mean, it does. Everyone has like a a loss. I guess everyone has like a. That's a yeah for a sure. Stinker. This... This and, happens you know, to everybody. Some people, later. some people, some people can get past their stinkers better than others. <laughs> That's right. Uh, she, I mean, from what I've seen from other people that do like her, they think she's super talented and like she probably has a long career ahead of her. So like, there, I think she'll be fine. And like, and I think, you know, with something like Indiana Jones, there won't be anyone to really like, in the at least cast wise, or anyone even behind the scenes. Really, I don't know who you blame for this not doing the business it should have. Like, I was like, hey, like, who do you put the kind of like, oh, it's like, you're the reason they didn't do well, or uh, the d- directing this. I mean, James, Man- a lot of people love James Mangold's movie, so it's not, I don't really think it's right. him. I like, to me, my opinion is, and I felt this way once I saw more trailers from the movie, other than that first teaser trailer, which I thought was really good, and it gave you that John Williams score towards the end, and it made you it reminded right. you of like how fun these movies are. After that, though, like, every trailer I saw after that, I just, I was like, I don't think I have an interest in like, see, like, I'm with I, you, I, I don't think we needed it. Like, it wasn't. <clears throat> I don't think anyone was begging for like one last ride with Indiana Jones. Like, it. I. Yeah. I bet. Yeah, at the time they <laughs> thought it was gonna make a killing, and then he just said, he, pretty he much up, everything he that could go wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah that exactly. Went wrong. I think everything that went wrong, that possibly could have did and then this has yeah. turned into just a nightmare but i bet you that was the ambition at the time or the the idea that it was it would be profitable but um i think regardless um even if it's not phoebe waller bridge that takes the the brunt of the blame um i bet you i would like to at least see some shake up at lucasfilm and disney in general because something is off Some it, it they've too much has gone wrong and too quick i think it would be naive of them not to shake up the hornet's nest and this movie bit. is very eye-opening, I think, for that. But it'll be interesting next few months to see how their next upcoming projects are going to be handled. They still obviously are taking a bit of a hiatus with the Writers uh, Guild right. strike and how uh, that's going to shake up you know, the MCU going forward. And again, like I mentioned last week, that's to their advantage. But uh, it'll definitely be something to keep an eye yeah. on going forward. I w- and I would love to know, like, internally, like, within those office walls, like, if they really thought like there would be enough interest to make this movie for three million hundred million dollars and turn like mm. a significant profit from it, like if they really thought like yeah, there's a high demand for this, that is like one of the, my biggest questions because like this yeah, doesn't this doesn't point. feel like a movie that opens to a hundred million more or like plus more like like that. It's not doing like one hundred, one twenty, one thirty. Uh, even if you were to, I would say like if you were to go like the highest I would go is like kind of where uh like I think Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was like a hundred point two, which is like right oh, on the okay. nose, right? Uh and right. then it opened over the Memorial Day uh weekend, so he got a boost from that. But okay. like but where that was based around like hype for it, you know, it hadn't been one in a while. Exactly. For this, Different for this, story. It, yeah, the highest I would have thought of it going if the reviews were better and all that would be maybe like eighty for the three 80? day. Like somewhere for around sure. there. I, like I don't that. think it. I don't think it goes higher than that, and I don't think it has unless it's a really great movie. There's no potential for it to have legs during the summer because another problem with all these movies coming out. I mean, we love it, but it seems like in in June it felt like one week we had one big movie, and then the next week there was another one, and then the next week there was another one. So there was no really room to breathe. The no. mar- the market the marketplace is really crowded. So that whatever previous blockbuster opened that week before needed good word of mouth in order to like stay around because now there's like a shinier object stepping in to like put right. to take some of its money so <laughs> that's hard too i mean there's a it's a very crowded 
I mean, a good time to be a movie fan because, like, you know, we didn't have this, you know, coming out of 2020, you know, going out of the pandemic and stuff. So it's cool that we have all these movies in a row. It's a good point. It also creates something the studios have to consider, though. (laughs) We have a movie slate now. Yeah, Um, like that. That could also be another problem. There's just too much out there. I mean, you can't really. Uh, you have can't to spread the wealth. Rely, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can't rely on your movie, you know, raking it all in for weeks at a time. But you know, yeah. if, if anybody benefits from this, it's going to be the film school or college kid in a few years that uses this movie as a case study. For, yeah. You know what I mean? For how not to, you know, promote, market, and release your movie, and like just all the different factors that you know led into this. And that'll definitely be a few a few papers written about it. Maybe you never know. I, I topic. agree. And uh, you know. We're in July now, July 5th, as we're recording this. So now we got to look at, look to the July releases. And, you know, we got Mission Impossible. We got Barbie, got Oppenheimer. There's like potential for some big money to be made. I mean, dude, I, uh, apparently Barbie entered box office tracking to open between 80 and a hundred million dollars. Oh Cause they, they said they're, they said there's such a marketing blitz right now. Like there's like their stores were reporting, like all their pink and Barbie related stuff is like sold out. Like people are just buying it in droves. Like this feels like yeah. the kind of movie people are going to dress up for and go see. That is a, like, a making, big advantage for that movie making for an, sure. An event. Oppenheimer uh, entered tracking at forty million, which I don't think is actually a bad for an uh, for a movie like that that's R rated in three hours. A forty million dollar opening weekend would be great. And if it has especially legs, against if, a movie like Barbie, yeah. And if it has legs Fair. like most of Nolan's movies, then then it'll be fine. Um, I'm really, I'm worried. I didn't think I would, this was not the case months ago, but like I am, I don't want his movie to suffer because of Barbie's success. I, I want them both to do well. Like I'm still excited for Barbie. Yeah. Um, more so for Oppenheimer, but um, yeah, for that. So I can't remember exactly. I'm sure he, he has a hefty price tag behind Oppenheimer. Do you know? Off the I top think of your head? so. Let, let me uh, look at it. I was going to mention that too, because his budgets are pretty lately, uh, pretty big. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I think a yeah, studio well, he is does w- a lot with those with that money though. So right, and studio is willing to do that uh, for him because he usually delivers. Um, right. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, Screen Rant actually uh, is saying that the budget right now is a hundred million dollars. That's what they're reading. So that's not oh. horrible. Oh, okay. Um. So like, I, I guess again, I don't. I mean, that's I'm not, judging. Ba- that's not bad. I'm, I'm judging visuals based on the trailer. I haven't seen the movie, of course, but if if you can k- keep your budget at that level, everyone can. If Christopher Nolan can keep his movie at a hundred million dollars, yeah. you all can. <laughs> Especially, and he, I mean, I mean, granted, he's been doing this for a couple decades, a little bit more, probably closer to two and a half. But Disney should know better. Just to bring it back to indie. They should know better on how to, you know, yeah. work with the budget and, you know. Anyway, I'll just put a lid yeah. on it. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's a good talking point though. I mean, they're they've it's uh you know, I've seen a lot of trades. I mean, I, I wrote a feature for Movie Web about it. Uh, a lot of people have been writing about it, is the ballooning budgets and marketing spend being spent on these movies is like insane. And how long before when there's not how many times can it, you not have a return on your investment before you start changing how much you spend yes. on your movies? And that is exactly. what I think needs to change. Like, how are you continuing to watch your two hundred million, three hundred million dollar movie kind of tank, and then be like, "Oh, well, for this next one, we'll we'll give you two hundred fifty million dollars to make it." And like, you know, like you gotta be a little bit more uh, frugal with this <laughs> with your money. One hundred percent. And you know, definitely investors and CEOs are gonna you know want answers for that and want change going forward, especially yeah. in a huge conglomerate like Disney that is yeah. not exactly making money with you know, a billion dollar, you know, a company that should be raking in the millions and billions that aren't, yeah. there's, you can't let it go on too long before, you know, questions are raised. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of, uh, we're getting in the trailers right now and I just wanted to, cause we were talking about budgets and yes. what have you. Doom part two is one of the movies that released a trailer, uh, last week, a second trailer, $122 million budget. That looks like a great looking movie too. Wow. And that's not, that's not that expensive. Uh, and you know, compared to most other blockbusters I mean, out there. Right. Big budget, but would have expected much it, more. From it costs like that. $40 million less than the first movie to make. 40, 40 so, or 48 million, 40, less. 40, 40 million dollars less. 40 so they, million less. so they went back, they went back to the drawing board. Like, okay, we can make this for this much cheaper. <laughs> right. so, I guess they probably already have so, costumes and sets and stuff left yeah, over. Yeah. So that's a big help. But 
you know, you know, good for good for Denny Villeneuve. That's awesome. Um, um, glad this is one less thing that that movie has to work against. So yeah, fantastic. exactly. Um, what did you think of the trailer? Second trailer, I, I'm I just just as excited to see it as I was for that first trailer that yeah. they dropped in. Um, I don't know. It's that trailer builds and builds and builds too. There's like the music gets like bigger. There's like this huge crescendo like towards the end of the trailer. It yeah. certainly looks. It looks. I mean, that everyone says that who who like Owen read the book too, and he said like this part of the book is more action. There's more action in it. Oh, okay. And, and you and you can tell like from the trailer that. Well, um, even even uh, the director said like this has a lot. The you know, now that you already know like the story that you got introduced to it, like they get into the action a bit more and sooner, and a bit more frequently in this one. Uh, right. Um, yeah, I'm with you. Like my excitement for this movie couldn't have been higher, no matter how many trailers they released. But one thing I will say is it's like kind of a negative. It's nothing against the trailer, just other than like I feel like it was too revealing. Like there's some things that were missing from trailer one that I was grateful not to have seen too much of. Like the big like there's gonna be obviously gonna we're coming towards a huge war. And I feel yeah. like we got a lot of footage from that, which is you know fine. Obviously they're gonna use that in promo material, but we do get some like close ups of Timothy Chalamet's character, Paul Atreides, going one on one with Austin Butler's character, whose name I can't remember, but like there's just some. He looks, he looks crazy. He looks freaky, <laughs> like, looks insane. Like, yeah, yeah. And I love his look, but like there's just some moments of like, you know, ten- intensity um, and some moments I think that are going to come to a head that are going to end up being huge moments in the film that like I just don't want to see in the trailer. Um, just because if not, going forward like i probably won't watch any other promo material unless it's like tv spots and stuff because i don't want too much spoiled so even though there wasn't like crazy spoilers there there was a a lot in this trailer that i would have liked to save for the big screen but i i get you know the trailer is doing its job it's putting butts in seats i get that but as somebody that's you know fed up with long trailers and has had experiences kind of dampened because of what trailers will show that i was just kind of cognizant of that but still a fantastic trailer. It looks beautiful. And we get a lot more. We get to see Christopher Walken finally, which was awesome. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he's featured in the last one. May, if maybe a glimpse, I can't remember. But he's looking good. We even get a couple lines of dialogue from him. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and he actually, and I was actually was surprised about how, because uh, I don't know how old he is now, but he still looks, you know, like he's still, uh, you know, got it. You know, like he doesn't look like too old. You know, I was like thinking like Christopher Walken was like older, older now. I mean, he still looks good. Yep. And um, yeah, I'm excited for it. it. Visually, it just looks like it looks really great. Um, I can't actually wait to rewatch Dune again. I'm trying to wait closer to when this comes out. I haven't like, watched yeah. I haven't watched uh, it since I uh, saw it in theaters. I was happy that I saw it in theaters and then just watch it at home because I, I know it got it got released at the same time on HBO Max. It was definitely one you needed to see. Yes, on the on the big Very screen. Very grateful to um, have seen it that way. And you know, for for some of my friends who were like. Hey, we sat through that long ass movie, and I wasn't even like a full movie. Yeah, I know, but you know, I, the reward. Yeah, I think, one. Yeah, yeah, I think the reward is like what we're about to get next, and uh, I'm excited. And I mentioned this too on Twitter. I was like, I think Doom Part Two is about to be like the return of the king of these two movies. Like, it has potential if it's really good and it gets yes. really good reviews. I think it'll. And, you know, the first one got some Oscar love, but I think that this one. To get more it's gonna go so, above and yeah. beyond i'm yeah. with you um i also hadn't seen it since it came out and have been like i knew this, this movie was greenlit i'm pretty sure a week or two into the first dunes box office uh run so knew this was coming and because of that didn't want to like tire myself out from re-watching the first one but yeah. i did pick up the 4k version of the blu-ray uh over the summer when it came out and so i'll have that to look forward to before yeah. And, and I got my, my 4K Blu-ray player now. So that's nice. going to look amazing come October because I'm sure I'll watch it right before going 4K, into it. That 4K changes everything, man. Man. <laughs> so many, and I don't so know if movies. I've seen. I don't think I've seen because I've only – this was among – I got all the – the first ever 4Ks I ever got were at this big market in this small – I don't know if we have any East Coast Canadian listeners that, that might know Sussex <laughs> and Brunswick, but there's this massive um, annual like summer big market uh, that comes to this town a couple of hours from me. And there's a couple of vendors there that just, just, uh, plug movies. And so they have literally h- hundreds to thousands to choose from. And like, so I'm get I got these four Ks for 15 bucks, like brand nice. new, like they, I don't know where they get them from, but I got that and the Batman on 4k and I got another 4k, but those are the only ones I got. And the, the first ones I ever bought, cause I'm only recent and like the switch from DVD to Blu-ray. Yeah. Um, 
but so I, and I don't think I had seen any of my other 4Ks yet. So that will probably be the first one I watch. So that'll be very much exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. That will be a good one. It'll look great on your, on a really nice TV. And, yes. Uh, and it'll prepare you uh, for when a little, <laughs> a little last minute prep once you go to see Dune Part 2. Totally. Again, like a, a little, a little refresher in case you need one. I'm going to need and one I for will. sure. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it looks it looks amazing, and of course, everyone, if you want to see it, it will be out on November third, uh, which will probably be here before you know it, because we're already in July, and this year is just flying Man. by. <laughs> we're in fly. month seven. Uh, they all month feel seven. that way lately. This is a pandemic. Um, Time has just gone past way really too fast. fast. Uh, then, from one potential Oscar contender to another, we got uh, yep. today as we're recording this today. We got uh, the second trailer for. Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, that first trailer they released was more of a teaser. Uh, this one was a bit more detailed, and it yeah made the movie look a little different than the teaser trailer did. I that agree. My... More of a crime epic. Yeah, and this is why Owen read the, read the book. He owns it, and I think I'm going to borrow it from him Jeez. and read the book because I just want to... Owen the bookworm. I didn't know this. Yeah, total total bookworm. Loves to read. Um, That's awesome. But I, uh, I kind of want to just because I want to have a little bit more context, I guess, to like what I'm going to see before seeing it. I um, understand. I got like, and this might be a not great comparison. Uh, Cause I know some, some people don't love the movie, but I, it, it gave me kind of like gangs of New York vibes a little bit in the way it looks. And uh, no, I get that. I see that. And uh, I, I, I like, yeah, it looks good. And another, another trailer that really built and built as it, as it was mm-hmm. uh, moving along. Uh, you know, it was, I think it's like two and a half minutes, like somewhere in there um yeah and i don't feel like it gave a lot away i mean it kind of just it presented the uh, aspects of the story that you know that are obvious and then uh that's what it needed to do and uh really showcased uh leonardo dicaprio bit robert de- uh, robert de niro uh, apparently lily glassstone is the one to watch here I, I can't really tell from the trailer but apparently from people who've seen the movie early saying that she is i've heard that above, too. above and beyond the best performer in the movie and she's probably going to get an oscar nomination too so i love that even um, against titans like leo and and robert de niro that is impressive yeah so um do you think that because it, it's getting a wide theatrical release it won't be out on apple tv plus until a later date uh, they still haven't like mm-hmm. fully disclosed the date yet do you think people are going to go see this in theaters or are they going to wait to watch it at home Cause this is a three hour, I think 24 minute movie might be longer somewhere in there. Yeah. A hefty uh, one. Uh, Ooh, you know what? That's a factor for sure. But I think what it's going to come down to, I would love to see it all get broken down like demographically. Cause I bet you the older audience is like people that have grown up watching Martin Scorsese that know what he can deliver. And even some of the newer like people probably like my age and a little younger that, that he's put out some really like, high value movies in the last few years that I think a lot of modern audiences are going to want that would go back to the theater just for him. Like I think of like Wolf of Wall Street was like very powerful when it came out, yeah. which, yeah. oh my God, also turns 10 this year if it hasn't already. Oh, that'll Shit. be a fun one. Yeah. That will be a fun <laughs> one. I don't think yeah. it has. We would have known if it had yet. So anyway, side note. Yeah. Um, but I bet you the younger audiences, I honestly, I don't feel like, honestly, thinking about it now, I don't know if Martin Scorsese and this movie in particular, maybe for Leo, I don't know if this movie and Martin really uh, appeal to like the younger generation. Yeah, so I don't yeah, know if I, even Bob is seeing on an Apple. Yeah, I think this is going to be a very much an adult skewing movie. Um, right. I, I hear the book has a really sizable fan base, but of course, older again. Right. Uh, you know what? The older demographic, sometimes they don't show up, but when it's a project that's really, really good and they want to support it, they do show up. So yes. I I could see it still performing decently with the older I think crowd. It would, yeah, because this would be something the older crowd will go to see, where they won't go see. Maybe they don't go see indie, but they're waiting yeah. for and the know, difference here next movie. Yeah, and the difference here won't be like a huge opening weekend. It'll be more about like how how much legs it has in the weeks after that. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I'm gonna go see it in theaters. I just because I've I mean I've been interested in, in it since they uh, announced it, and that that team up of De Niro and Leo with Scorsese mm-hmm. hasn't really hasn't really steered us wrong much before so um I'm looking forward to it and, I, and I'm glad that the tri- I mean uh some people were kind of commenting on how the movie does look a little bit different than what was being presented in that teaser but that was only a teaser and they really didn't show much so 
I think they had to kind of show a little bit more of like it having a bit more action, a bit more to it than it being yeah, uh, just a drama. Uh, so another yeah, one. So I, so I appreciate the you know, the different look at it. I agree. Another one where I'm not gonna be like a like. I want just like the excitement to build and I don't want to like be seeing everything in trailers. So I'm going to be a little bit hesitant before I jump into watching the next like promo for this movie. Cause it's an, is yeah. it October or November? Uh, October, October. So it's a little sooner. Yeah. Okay. That's for July. So it's only, you know, almost three months. I'm sure we'll get another trailer, but I, I don't know. This has been a trend I've noticed like since the Batman, I feel like it's like where I really started. Cause the, as awesome as the trailers were, we did get some of the best moments of that movie in that, in yeah. those trailers. And that was, kind of what what i began to notice like how much of an impact trailers will have on the theatrical experience so i am a little bit hesitant not gonna lie about watching like trailers number two and three or like the very very lengthy one so we'll see i guess i wish i could avoid trailers like some people do like they're they're built into the work it's harder to do what we do i have to watch them so i'm like i can't i can't just post them at least without watching them though i guess i could just post them because they send you like they send you like a blurb of what to say, like yo, know, like just put the synopsis in there and who's in it, and okay, you, okay. Just really, you really could just post it and be like, oh, I won't watch it. Um, but it's hard like when this it's, where we talk it's, news. It's yeah, hard yeah. not to. Yeah, it's hard when it's like in your face. So like you, uh, but yeah, I kind of agree with you. I think I've seen like en- enough where I'm like, all right, I don't know if I want to. I know I'm going to see it. What else do yeah, I need yeah. to be watching trailers for? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I don't know. It looks really good, and like I. You know, once once we're covering Oscar season, I think that movie is going to be one that is in that conversation uh, for sure. The snubs we're going to get this year are going to be legendary. There's been yeah, so many, be crazy. many fantastic yeah. movies. Like they they can't all get recognized, and that's going to be a bloodbath by the Oscars. Yeah. Like 2023 is shame it'll be a real strong year, and there's so crazy yeah. crazy releases still coming out. So Agreed. it's been a good year for the movies. Yep. And if you guys are interested in seeing Killers of the Flower Moon in theaters, it opens on October 20th. And then it will be on Apple TV Plus at a later date. We're going to have to look for that date because they haven't. Uh, and very nice. smart that they haven't really fully disclosed that date. So very people smart. aren't So people aren't like looking around. Right, I'll just wait until like November, whatever. <laughs> and like, well done, Apple. Smart play. Oh. They, they feel like a studio. Where I was always kind of hesitant when they started breaking into the streaming. Yeah. Um, but they've done good so far. They, made they do well. They last year, they, which was awesome. Yeah, they do well with like the movies. They, they've got. They've. I think they have signed really good deals with some really legendary people, like really good filmmakers and stuff. And yes, they are, and they aren't so just hoarding in their stuff. Like oh, like premiered here exclusively. You know, they've worked out deals right. where like these movies get released in theaters and then go to their platform. So maybe that's making good all... decisions, which I never yep. thought I would say, but yep. whatever. Crazy to think good for them. Um. um this just makes me think too. Like we must be very, very close to a uh, the killer trailer because that has the same similar. Yeah, reason. I think it's just a week it. after or soon. Like right I think so. Killers of the Flower Moon. So that is something to look out for here soon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I know that that that'll be pretty. That'll be so great to see. Can't wait. Mm-hmm. More Finch, more David Fincher in my life. I yeah. will take it. Yeah, hundred percent. Um. So I know we already mentioned the box office because it was kind of built into our Indiana Jones. Uh, story about how that performed um but we have uh predictions to this week um uh, i think this is the first time we've pre- predicted for a horror movie so this will be fun um mm. uh so it is for uh insidious the red door it is opening this friday um tracking has it like i mentioned deadline thinks it could make between 23 to 25 million this weekend uh, okay i think the, that's respectable at, at the low end they said maybe 22 um i haven't seen any early reviews and stuff yet i think it's under embargo still until uh which is not always a great sign if they hold the reviews uh, so late but we all but it was a holiday weekend like a holiday week so maybe that could be why there's they are holding it uh okay. not not entirely sure but to give you a little uh it's crazy that this franchise has this many movies in it like, <laughs> but who would have thought but, first one's pretty solid i get it. it's getting sequels great i'm like get yeah. this far so Insidious came out in 2010, surprised everyone, uh, open to $13.2 million its opening weekend, but had great legs uh, throughout its run. It ended up making $54 million at the domestic box office and $100 worldwide on a $1.5 million budget. Um, so it, they made some money and then some on that. Crazy to think that uh, come September, it'll be 10 years 
uh, since Insidious Chapter Two opened, uh, wow. because Insidious was such a sleeper hit and did even better when it came out on Blu-ray. Um, Insidious Chapter Two is able to open the forty point two million dollars. Um, of course, they had Whoa. a typical they had a typical big horror movie fall after that, <laughs> but um, yeah, okay, fair enough. It, it ended up making eighty three point five million domestic. So if you have a forty million dollar opening weekend and you only made eighty three million dollars, <laughs> that means it fell pretty hard in subsequent right. weeks. Still made but, a lot and, more than the predecessor. That's good yeah. sign. And yeah. then and then and then made one hundred sixty one point nine million worldwide, and that was on a five million dollar budget. So they still a still five, turned a five million, million dollar million dollar budget? budget. Yeah, so okay. they still turned a profit. What? Uh, Insidious That's Chapter crazy. Three came two years later, um, and you know I think people are kind of like, all right, Insidious Two not as good, but I'm still down to like revisit this franchise. Uh, Insidious Chapter Three opened to twenty two point six million dollars, made fifty two point two million dollars domestic and one hundred twelve point nine million worldwide on a ten million dollar budget. As you notice, like each movie they put more money into. <laughs> um, okay, it doubled down to a third. That's interesting. And then the last film before this new one, uh, Insidious The Last Key, improved on the performance of the third one, open to $29.5 million, uh, made $67.7 million domestic and $167.8 million worldwide, also on a $10 million budget. So yeah, if you're wondering why we keep getting these, is that they've all That's why. made money. They've all made money. $167 in the fourth entry? That's so, pretty yeah. crazy. I kind of think Deadline's pretty on the money with the tracking here, though, because I feel like it lands somewhere in between Chapter Three and the Last Key, as far as because yeah. Chapter Chapter Three made twenty two opening weekend, the Last Key did twenty nine uh, on opening weekend. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say twenty five. Okay, I'm one, glad you went one. with that. Fair enough. So you're going in the middle of three and four, and I can understand that. Um, maybe call it bias. I'm not crazy on the insidious franchise actually i don't i've seen the first time i'll say i'm a fan of the first so i remember yep. my last watch of it i feel like i didn't like it as much as i had in previous years um second one i really did not like actually and then i don't think i've seen any of the other ones since yeah. but that being said you know i gotta respect the first it, one's good the first one's solid first one's it, solid it don't give me right even though up, i didn't like it as really much well. it still holds up like it's good yeah. Um, I feel like it's really, I just look at that movie as like James Wan's warm up to the conjuring and I just feel like yeah. <laughs> conjuring is a so much better than I yeah. feel, but, um, I also feel like this is a series that I think just gives away all its good scares in the trailers, which isn't a knock against the movie, but the marketing, but anyway, side note, I'm going 20 is what I'm getting at here. So okay. That's I like when we have a little, you know, a little difference in between. So 5 million, yeah. you, so you're the winner last week with your spot on prediction for Indy. Um, We'll see, I guess, who reigns champ by next week. So yeah, 25 so for you, 20 for interesting, me. It's interesting, though. If it goes 25, that means, and if Indiana Jones drops the way they think it might, Insidious could be number one this weekend, which is so crazy to think. But if it goes on the lower end where you have it, then it ends up in second place uh, behind Indiana Jones. Okay. Um, still, uh, I imagine the budget on this is probably super low, like the other ones. Right. Uh, so and this is why Hollywood... Also, you know what they get? They get it. They get it so wrong making their big budget movies, but they get it right when they make horror movies because horror movies weird, are cheap, eh? are, are cheap yeah. to make, and they uh, and they are. It's so weird that there was a time where like horror in the early '90s was not a sure thing at the box office at all, and now Look in recent years, it's such a sure thing now. Like it's yeah. such. Everyone's like, "Hey, give us five million dollars to like make something that might scare the hell out of you," and yeah. You know, we'll give you can make like 20 30 million dollars by the end by the end of its run and uh i love to see that though because it's uh you know it's a genre that doesn't get like a ton of respect so uh i'm glad that the industry and i, I also hate seeing stories where it's like oh like we're so surprised to see horror doing so well like how often do you need to be surprised why yeah. like, like it's been like years like 20 plus years. years now of Years and years and years of this of this going on. Like I think it's pretty obvious that or mm. there's a market for it. Uh and this will probably prove that again, yet again. So I am kind of ready for this series to die though. Like five movies I think is <laughs> a, a lot for Insidious. I never would have thought this, but I will give it you no know, respect. I was so what are we? This is uh two thousand eleven or twelve when this came out. Because Conjury's twenty thirteen, so this must have been twenty twelve. Yeah, so, so, so twenty so the first one came out in twenty ten. 
the first one did. Part 10. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, chapter two came out the same. Actually, what's crazy is that chapter two, chapter two comes out the same year as The Conjuring, and they were both directed by James. Uh, he directed both of them. And like, what's funny is that I feel like when you watch chapter two and you watch The Conjuring, you could tell you had a director whose focus was split. <laughs> oh, I like because yes. like because it's exactly. it's, it's, it's chapter two is not nearly as good as the first no. one. No. Uh, That's a and busy the year for James. Yeah, Warren, and the and the Conjuring was uh, just a great, well, solid haunted house. Still movie. one mean, of the so... better horror movies of this century, yeah. I'd say. Yeah, so very um, good. But I remember being a so I would have been twelve then when the marketing for Insidious uh, started coming out. Maybe just turned thirteen, and I remember being scared shitless in my room, can't even look at my TV because the trailer is on. And yeah. uh, it was—it's a feeling that I cherish. I love to be scared, and that was a great time in my life to where I was still kind of scared by scary movies. But yeah. as it was not something that lasted. It's hard, so I'll give credit where it's due. Like the first one did frighten me quite a bit. It, so. Insidious, <laughs> Insidious has like the one of the best jump scares I've ever seen. The, the and, red yeah, face, red face. Yeah. Behind, like, I, 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 I still like I. I feel like I know when it's coming. I've seen that movie so many times, and like, Same here. I'm like and I'm always like, "Where is it during her fucking monologue that it why it happens?" <laughs> it cuts to Patrick Stewart like, like, like several like, times in that scene, yeah. and you're like, "Okay, when?" And is I'm it, always when is like, it? but that first time, man, I I I, I didn't scream. It was more like a, I yelled a little bit, but it like caught me but so off guard. <laughs> that is a like, moment Whoa. they put in the trailer. Like, why that would have been yeah, so awesome yeah. to not have seen before going in i just that bothers me so much but yeah whatever it's still effective jump scare no doubt about it yeah um, really well done yeah well and um, his uh so his return to because to he, he'll be in this one right i think that demon is making a return yeah. if yeah. i'm not mistaken and patrick yeah. wilson's directing it you know his first time directing a feature film right um, how did yeah. i not remember that so that's so that's cool for him he's been a part like part of the whole he's been part of the james Wan adjacent universe for a yeah. very long time between this movie and between this franchise and the conjuring and i you know and him and vera formiga i think are doing another conjuring movie together um it's so out you of the tell- show uh oh yeah well i thought they announced the movie and they are doing a show too but i'm not sure how that okay maybe uh, it's gonna work out i just know about the show but- um and and i actually think all three of those movies have been i know the the third one the devil made me do it some people didn't like that it wasn't like a haunted house kind of like con- conjuring movie but i, I mean I'm, I, it was well- interesting that they it was interesting that they pivoted it a little bit uh there and, is I mean, quite a bit of hard there, house part in there, it right yeah but it wasn't i mean it was more of a not like exclusively yeah yeah right right, right. like a court so, there's like some court yeah, aspects stuff, stuff. yeah i think they did they handled the third one well like i think they needed to kind of switch up the formula a bit even if it wasn't like crazy amount i'm a fan of the third one i like them all but first one still reigns supreme for me yeah really well done um and so are we gonna um wrap things up with a couple of things too uh we did yeah. something that we mentioned offline uh about the movie anniversaries and we're gonna uh announce it here too and then put it up on socials uh moving forward like so beginning this month july and as long as we do these anniversary episodes we're gonna pick a certain bunch of them uh that are you know that have anniversaries coming up and uh we're gonna put them up on socials and let you guys pick which one we should cover um 100 and and also uh, i'm throwing this out there because there are some other podcasters that listen to us and there's also other just movie fans that listen if there is a movie that you're super passionate about and you're like if we pick it and you're like hey i would love to like be a guest and talk about it with you guys that is also totally acceptable too like don't be afraid to to reach out guys we'll love to have you on as well uh uh, we're recording uh out of sight on monday and merc has been asking me about out of sight since (laughs) since the calendar year turned to 2023 because he knew it was it was turning 25 this year mm-hmm. uh, and it, it's one of his favorite like Soderbergh movies and uh I actually love that movie a lot too I think it 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 holds up really well I just watched it again uh a few days ago I might watch it again too before we record uh I mean I might watch it a little bit too early but it's just typical like really good Steven Soderbergh stuff and Jennifer Lopez when she really focused on like acting like you're like this girl is gonna go places mm. as an actress like it's one of her best performances uh that she's given and george clooney also great in it and their chemistry is like through the roof top like, notch like, yeah yeah they are they are they are just throwing dialogue off each other like it's like season pros man it's so perfect great to watch um so yeah like if, if you're a fan like that and you really just love a certain movie and that you see something on the list that you want to join us for you want to pick um we would love uh to have you 
on with us and we just want to make the anniversary stuff a little bit more uh interactive so it's not just us because how we pick it guys it's if jackson's passionate about one there's one in september i think he's passionate about uh <laughs> Yeah. And, then there, and then there's some that like i'm passionate about and then there's just some that's like all right it's popular let's just do it right um it's hard so to narrow them all down it's really hard there's really i know there's been some that we missed and some people are like oh why did you do one for that movie you know i think we've gotten pretty lucky uh you know when we kind of did something like spring breakers which is not an obvious like anniversary episode but right. it did kind but of it did really did really well yeah. for us so like it was you know i think it depends on i think there's some of these like a smaller uh not as well known movies that people are passionate about they're like oh like i would love to revisit that how many ever mm-hmm. years later um we noticed that with can't hardly wait that was another big episode for us too um and of course, but of course there are certain biggies that we hate to miss like we had to do jurassic park there was no way we could uh, miss that yes. but then we we did miss return of the jedi and it was like all right well do we want to do it there are going to be a lot of people covering it there's a lot of good that goes into uh, the decisions, the, th- the thought process. Well, we want to make you a part of it. <laughs> so and I'm really glad. I feel like this is a great new, like, kind of way to get the audience engaged and trying to leave the ball in their court a little bit and, and see what they want to see from us. But while we still get to, you know, decide on some of our favorite movies that we get to cover. So I think this is a fantastic idea. And we love hearing from you guys, the listeners. And we want to know what you guys want to see from us too. And I think yeah. this is just an awesome opportunity to kind of like meet in the middle and still deliver on the anniversaries that we want to talk about and while giving you guys, you know, uh, a choice as to what that's going to be. So um, I'm sure no doubt we'll probably reach months or weeks where there's a lighter anniversary schedule options might not be, you know, <laughs> as plentiful as they'll be probably like in the summertime. Cause there's going to be a lot of good ones in July, even a lot yeah. of strong ones in June. And, but you know, we'll uh, put them up for our socials like Gaius mentioned, and uh, you guys can always, well, you guys will have the chance to vote there um, yeah. on what you guys want to see. Because I know, like Donnie, Donnie's reached. He reached out when Twenty Eight Days Later had a twentieth uh, anniversary, oh, and I was man, like, and I was like, awesome. yeah, and he, I was like, I really want to do that, but I was like, but like, be kind of excited. We still have to figure it out, but I think there is going to be a big focus on horror movies in September and October on this show. Yes. Um, yeah. so we we want to do really a lot excited for. We, we're doing we're going to because september is going to be you know it's usually a slower month movie wise uh so and, that's when and i start spooky and, season watches yeah, it's yeah so and Jack, slow. And jackson and i both love horror movies so like dedicating two months to it it's perfect so uh a lot of those anniversaries that are coming up in the summer if we miss them we're going to find some way to kind of showcase those movies like rosemary's baby had a big anniversary during the summer mm. and that would have been a good one to do, but like just shift it. Might just shuffle it down the, the schedule a little bit. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. 28 days later might be a good opportunity to do that too. I feel bad that we had to miss that one because I'm actually super re- due for a rewatch of that too. I would love to cover yeah. that. Um, I've already been uh, messaged about Halloween H20 because that turns 25 mm-hmm. uh, in August. That might be one that gets done in August when it actually has its anniversary. Why the but because hell was that movie released in August? Well, well, what's crazy is that the Halloween franchise has a lot of anniversaries. And thankfully, two of the big ones are during the month of October. Uh, the original Halloween, I think, is 45 uh, and this year. And then uh, Halloween 4, the return of... Oh. And, and then Halloween 4, the return of Michael Myers will be uh, 35. Um, so that'll be good for the October, uh, season. So perfect for that. Um, it is weird that H2O was released during the summer, but I guess it was like a uh, movie, movie. Um, fair. So yeah, also, it's a big one. I, I also excited, like, you know, we, Child's Play has a big anniversary, uh, this uh, year too. That movie's awesome. I saw around, it the first time, like last year. Yeah. Around the time I think we'll yeah. be doing spooky season as well. So yeah, yeah. There's Let's a lot of horror. There. There's a lot of horror movies that we were going to, uh, cover, uh, cause we do talk about horror a lot. And mm-hmm. I know we haven't really had like a big anniversary for any horror movie that's come out. It'll uh, be nice that... to focus on some horror around that time of the year. Cause it just feels so right to me. Like that's how I right. even well before the podcast that's for the last few years. That's how I've uh, kind of like arranged my movie watching schedule. Like I pretty yeah. much try with the exception of new releases um, and the odd hankering to watch something. I will pretty much exclusively watch horror from September to October. And uh, yeah. I'm excited to be able to do that too with someone that loves horror movies. I, I love that. So yeah, yeah, looking very much forward to to that time of the year. And um, one last thing we're going to announce to you, you always hear us uh, mentioning playlists, uh, playlist studios. They're the our podcast network that 
does a lot of the heavy heavy lifting that we don't do mostly the editing and audio stuff uh makes our lives a lot easier because we can just focus on content um you've heard on the show before like how they came approached g reels about doing a podcast is that you know remember i thought it was too good to be true they were like hey we want to see if you're interested in joining our podcast network we will edit all your stuff we'll do this we'll do that and you'll have you can just create the content you have creative control your name is copyrighted under you um all we want you to do is to join our network because we're trying to launch a app uh for different podcasts that will be showcasing our original shows and like a lot of things, like a lot of upstarts, it, it, there's ups and downs and like when it's going to launch, when it's going to happen. Uh, they, they've constantly kept all of their uh, podcasts in the loop about when their, when their app is going to launch. And it's finally going to launch on July 7th, which is uh, Friday this week. Um, yeah. It'll be available in over 178 countries and across all Apple devices on that date. Uh, they are currently working with uh, their developers for the Google Play Store uh, to get their app on there as well. Uh, it will probably be on there, uh, could be on there on that same date, but maybe a little, a few days after, because uh, they're still working out uh, stuff with like the Android platform and all that. Um, but you'll be able to stream their catalog of podcasts, including ours, ad free. And you'll be able to subscribe to your favorite shows on there as well. And there will be no subscriptions or fees as well to uh, uh, listen to any of their shows. So what you'll be hearing a lot at the end of our episodes moving forward is to remind you to download the play uh, the yes. play- playlist app. Which and you listen- definitely should. And listen to us on the playlist app. Of course, wait. Like, find us if you find us on good pods or apple Podcasts, spotify that's all great too but um we want to give them a platform to be get their stuff discovered because they've given us a platform to put this show out there and um and you'll see a lot of our imagery on a lot of the ads that they're putting out for uh the podcast launch and they're going to be giving us uh some more information regarding um what we need to do to promote it uh, on mm-hmm. our end uh, in the days ahead. But yeah, you'll be hearing that like Jackson will be adding the playlist stuff to his closing uh, yes. spiel at the end of the episode. Certainly. So, starting, so, today. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, starting today. Sorry today. So, uh, so yeah, we're very excited for them and really excited for because uh, uh, not just ours, every show that's on there, that's another avenue to be uh, discovered uh, in this very crowded podcast environment so um right. more power to them and we're happy to be along for the ride and can't wait to uh continue to grow with them so just wanted to throw that Abs- out there as well absolutely we are and yeah just a shout out to them real quick um they've been great at keeping us in the loop uh in terms of like the development of the app because i know obviously they ha- probably had these discussions with you first gaius but like yeah um they were uh, very welcoming and encouraging of feedback they let us kind of test out the beta beforehand which was fantastic yeah. i th- thought the app I got the chance obviously to experience experience it a little bit firsthand, provide some feedback. Thought it was pretty much flawless. It's great. It, it yep. looks fantastic. It was easy to navigate. Um, our our show gets a lot of love on there, which I'm very happy to see. And yep. yeah, we're very excited to for you guys to experience it for yourselves and you know share to your friends that happen to love podcasts that are looking for another avenue to check it out because uh, we will be up there and you guys can listen to us there. Wherever else you guys get your podcast too. So yeah, shout out playlists. Um, if you guys are listening on Friday, then today will be the first day that the app launches and you guys can go check us out on over there. But uh, if you're listening to us on Thursday, um, thanks again for tuning in to Black to the Blockbuster, guys. This has been episode 106. Uh, hope you guys enjoy the listen. We got lots of more content coming your guys' way. You guys know the drill by now, uh, but if you're just joining us, you guys can find us anywhere where you guys get your podcasts and anywhere on social media at the handle Back to the Blockbuster. Uh, I've been Jackson. You've been Gaius. This has been Back to the Blockbuster, episode 106. Thanks for joining us on the ride, guys. And Gaius, I'll be talking to you throughout the week uh, and shaping up next week's episode. Can't wait for it, brother. Yep. Sounds good. Peace, everybody. Take care.